reason they're called minor is nothing to do with the content. I mean, the content is, is very uh, substance and, and major, but they're minor because they're length. And all of these are very short books. In fact, we as a church, if you sign up for the epistle, um, there's a reading plan, and we as a whole congregation, we're, we're reading through all of the minor prophets uh, throughout the week, so uh, we encourage you to sign up with that. But for our time today, we're going to be looking at one of these prophets in particular, uh, the prophet Micah. Now, uh, here's the deal. Uh, sometimes the minor prophets, they're hard to read. Because, because, you know, you're like, like, what's going on? How, what, is this something for me today? Is this something for, you know, the nation of Israel back then? You know, what am I supposed to take away from this? But I love the book of Micah. Uh, because the book of Micah, it's very practical. And that's, just, that's how my mind works. I'm, I'm a very practical guy. I like people to just, just tell me what you want, right? Just tell me what to do. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of us do, right? I mean, that's why in high school, right, you had the, you had the guidance counselor, right? The person that you went to, like, met with twice, and they were going to tell you your whole life, you know, how it's going to play out. Um, I remember, I was, I was so frustrated in high school. I had the worst guidance counselor. Like, she was the worst, all right? Like, even, even like, the, the motivational posters in her room were the worst, right? Like, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm thinking about this idea of guidance, and, like, like she had the poster, and maybe you've, you've seen it. We've all seen it, right? It's the poster it's like the bear, it's like the, and he's in a river, and like, and there's like a salmon like jumping up a waterfall, and it's like, and it like, it catches it like right in its mouth. And like, at the bottom of the poster, it's like, persistence pays off. <laughs> Not for the salmon. <laughs> like, think, like, you ever, like, like, there is no more persistent animal than a salmon. Do you, like, I mean, this is where my mind goes, and I start Googling salmon. Do you under, do you realize that, that of the salmon eggs that are spawned, only 10% survive? Only 10%. So then it's just a fight just to live. And then they survive and they live in the ocean for up to five years, trying not to get eaten by shark or whatever else wants to eat them. And then one day, this little salmon's like, you know what? I want to go home. <laughs> Forget the fact that it goes from salt water to fresh water and what is entailed with that. It starts to swim upstream up to 900 miles. 900 miles upstream. It can raise, it go up in elevation up to 7,000 feet above sea level. It's just swimming along, jumping up waterfall, swimming along, jumping up waterfall. And you know what the bear's doing this whole time? Hibernating. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, this lazy bear just wakes up, it's like, I'm thirsty. And it goes over to a river, and, it's, and a fish jumps in its mouth. Persistence pays off, right? Like... <laughs> The caption should be like, don't jump in bears' mouths. That's what it should say. My guidance counselor was the worst. I remember, I remember I met with her. She's like, Brad, you have to just take your grades seriously. You stop clowning around. You can't just stand up and tell jokes your whole life. <laughs> Showed her. <laughs> but we all want guidance, right? You, you, we all want just tell us what to do and we'll do it. How do we live a good life? How do we succeed? How do we get ahead? We want that. When you went to college, I went to college and you had your advisor, right? Many of us had that experience of a college advisor. Told you what class to take, when to take them. Told you, you know, what internships to do. And, and, and you know, if you're going to progress in this career, they kind of got you on that right path. We just want to be told what to do clearly. And so for me, the book of Micah is kind of that. It's God very clearly telling us what to do. It's God very clearly telling us what it looks like to live in his will, to live in a way that honors him. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you, you can open it up to uh, the book of Micah. Um, if you're going to use one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you or underneath your seat, um, I think it's on page 647. And, uh, and we're going to look at the book of Micah. And, and, and basically, the book of Micah, it's only seven chapters long. And these aren't long chapters. It's seven chapters long, and it actually kind of chunks up into two big chunks, okay? Uh, the first three chapters, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same with all of the minor prophets. The first three chapters are, are just kind of God telling Israel what they're doing wrong. 
Like, I mean, this whole time in the nation of Israel, it's a very tumultuous time for them. This is a time where they are just constantly under oppression, constantly under attack, constantly having to fight for their lives. And, and there's times where they're, they're close to God and they're far from God, and they're close to God and they're far from God. And, and, and so this is God kind of like showing up and, and telling them what's going on. This is a time where empire after empire is coming through their region and just, you know, uh, you know attacking them. You have the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, you have the Medes, the Persians, just wave after wave. And they're, and, 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 and they're feeling like, where are you, God? They're feeling like, like, when can we come up for a breath? They're feeling, God, why are you not like fighting for us is, is kind of what's going on. And so then in chapter 4, God starts to speak to them and give them words of hope. In chapter 4, God starts to talk to them about these wars won't go on forever. At some point, you will have peace. At some point, you will have comfort. And then chapter 5, God kind of tips his, tips his hand to what he's doing. He tells them this and is trying to encourage them. He says, but you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And I love it. Like when you read the Old Testament, and I hope you are reading the Old Testament. I know a lot of you know, followers of Christ that are, you know, and Christians are like, we just need the New Testament. We, we don't really have to read the Old Testament. But like the Old Testament is so beautiful. And the Old Testament is just so profound. Because it, 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 in the New Testament, you hear about this grace. But the Old Testament, you get to read everything that it went through, that God went through to give us this grace. And so here, even in Micah chapter 5, you see God giving this foreshadowing of Jesus. God giving this foreshadowing of of our Savior, of our Messiah who's going to come. And so here's this tiny nation who's constantly under oppression from these other empires. And, and in this nation, there's this region called Judah. And in this region, there's this nothing of a town called Bethlehem. And God is telling the nation, the region, the town, he says, stay firm, fight the fight, because out of your little town, I am going to raise up a mighty Savior. I'm going to save the world. And so he's just giving them hope that there's purpose in what they're going through and that God is going to do something significant through them. And then to get to chapter 6. And this is my favorite chapter in this book because, I mean, this is where, honestly, where I would be. I mean, first off, I, I love that in the beginning of chapter 6, you kind of see God's emotion. And I think a lot of times we think, you know, of God, you know, he's perfect and, and, and he never, you know. But like at the beginning of the chapter, God kind of like, he shows his emotion towards his people. Because these people are constantly, you know, uh, just complaining. They're constantly walking away from him. And, and God says this, chapter 3, he says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He's, he's like, why are you mad at me? Because this other army is attacking you. Do you realize you weren't even a nation? Do you realize that you were in slavery? Do you realize what your future would have been had I not brought you out of that? Had I not given you this land? Have I not given you my spirit and my word? Have I not been with you? Why are you mad at me? And then he, he starts to echo back what he's heard from them. Skip down to verse six, it says this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings or calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with, the, with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? Like, I hope you can read the sarcasm here. These, these, these aren't genuine, you know, like the, the, the nation of Israel, is, what do you want, God? What do you want from me? Do you want you know, a thousand rams? Do you want 10,000 rivers of oil? Do you want my very own son? What do you want to be pleased by, for me, by me? And, I, and I, I think that's where some of us are today. And if we're not there, at some point you'll probably be there. 
where you're trying to live for God, you're trying to honor God, you're trying to, to walk uh, this, you know, this line and, and live this life, but, but things just don't get better. Army after army, oppression after oppression, hardship after hardship still goes through your life. And, you, and you, like you, like me, we might get fed up. What do you want, God? I mean, maybe some, maybe some of you are here and you started going to church. You, you recently just started following God and your life's actually gotten worse. You're just, you know, what do you want? I'm waking up on Sunday morning. I'm going to the church services. I'm trying to be, what do you want from me? And what I love about the book of Micah, particularly this very next verse, is that God clearly and definitively tells us what he wants. He clearly and definitively tells us what it looks like to live for him, live in a way that's pleasing to him. So if you're taking notes, Micah 6, 8, if, if, if you're looking for a verse to memorize, Micah 6, 8 is a great verse. It says this, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If you want to know what it is to live in the will of God, if you want to know what it is to live in a life that honors God, if you want to know what it is to be a follower of God, it's these three things. Act justly, love mercy mercy. Walk humbly. And so I guess my question then for us this morning is, how are we doing in these three areas? How are you doing in those areas of your life? I love the verbs, right? I love the verbs before each one, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. Like, it, it, it kind of takes, this is not just something you should know about. This is not something you should just understand. This is something that you are to do. This is something you are to live out. This is something that you are to, to put into action in your life. So then the question for us is, are we doing them? Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's unpack these three just a little bit more because, because I think it's easy sometimes to, to misunderstand what, what God is asking for here. So first off, this idea of to act justly. Now, most of the time, I, I, specifically in our culture, when we hear the word just, like to be just or to bring about justice, I don't know what you think of. Usually the first thought that comes to my mind is Walker, Texas Ranger. I'm just weird like that. But, um, but you, you know, usually when we think of justice, we think of like punitive like, like punishment for people who do wrong. Like, like if we're going to be just people, then we need to be punishing the wrongdoers. Uh, and that's usually where our mind goes with justice. What's interesting is as you read scripture, that's like definition B of the word justice. You know, you look, open the dictionary, you, you know, the defined words. There's like the main definition. Is, and, and the, 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 the Justice, almost exclusively in scripture, it's not about punitive. It's not about punishment, uh, punishing those who do wrong. Justice is actually more about doing right to the marginalized. Doing right to those who are downtrodden. To, to, to be a person of justice in scripture is to be a person who is upright, to be a person who is lifting up uh, the, the poor, to lifting up the, the widows, to lifting up the orphans, the people who are looking out for those who are around them. That is what justice is. In fact, uh, in the New Testament, James, I mean, that's what he talks about. He says, you know, religion that your father sees is pure is look after orphans and widows in their distress. In fact, it's interesting, in the New Testament, the, the, the word justice uh, is, and the word righteousness is the exact same word in the Greek. There, there's, it's, it's, it's dikaios. It's the exact same word. And so as you're reading the New Testament in the Greek, anytime that you read, you know, the word righteousness, you, you, can, you can substitute justice. It's the exact same thing. And I think about, you know, in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus says, you know, seek first his righteousness. And it's like, seek first his justice. Blessed are those who, who long for God's righteousness. It's blessed are God those loves, long for God's justice. Whose hearts break for what breaks God's heart. Who wants to help those who are outcasts. Are we being just? And here's the thing. I, and I know, like the world we live in, I don't know about you, but I get overwhelmed in the world that we live in. When I, especially when I see all of the injustice in this world. 
I mean, you turn on the news and you just see all of this injustice. Like, I mean, just people, you, like, I feel like you can't trust anyone anymore, right? You can't trust anybody. I mean, I like, think, you know, the whole Cosby thing and that happened, now Hulk Hogan, and that happened. If Optimus Prime gets arrested, I have no childhood heroes left, okay? <laughs> I feel like you can't trust anyone. And, and, and then you turn on the news and there's, and there's just all this, you know, hurt and heartache. There's shootings and, and, and terrorism and, and just all this stuff. And I don't know about you, but I get kind of, you know, just overwhelmed. And I feel like I just want to just take my family, I want to take my wife and my daughters, I just want to hunker down in our home and we're just going to stay here. We're not going to turn on the TV because that's way too scary. We're definitely not going outside because that's where they are. We're just going to stay here and be safe. But what's interesting is that's not what God calls us to do. If you want to be followers of God, then you have to act justly. You have to engage with the injustice of this world. You, you, we have to stop acting like being victims and understand that we have a calling on our lives, that the Spirit of God is in us and through us, and that we need to go out into this world and we need to shine and show people what justice is, what love is. We need to live this out. It's interesting that all these three things, all these things that Micah say, says, Jesus also says. And Jesus kind of like heightens them. He takes them up a notch. In fact, I love the way Jesus talks about this idea of us engaging with the world. He says this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I mean, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He says, but you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Like, do you understand? You, you're supposed to be the salt on this earth. I don't know, but I, I love that. Because first off, I just love salt, okay? Can I just say that? Like, I, I love salt. Like, some of you are like, like sweets people. You like cupcakes and coffee. Yeah, no, no, no. I like salty. Things. I like chips. I like pretzels. Like, when I mow the yard, I like just bags of sunflower seeds until my mouth just, like, puckers up. Like, I love salt, okay? In fact, my wife and I, We've been married, I think it's, uh, we've been married 13 years. We've only gotten like two arguments in 13 years, okay? One was when she tried to convince me that cheerleading was a sport because it's not, you know? And, <laughs> but, the other, but the other was, I, I, remember, I remember we were you know, newly married, we're in our apartment, and, and my wife came home from the grocery store. She came home from the store, and I was going to help her unpack the groceries because I'm going to be a good husband. And we're unpacking, you know, all this stuff. And then well, I pulled out of the bag... This, this bottle of brown liquid, right, with a green cap. Mm-hmm. I said, baby, what's this? She goes, it's soy sauce. I said, no, it's not. It's not soy sauce. Yeah, it is. It's just low sodium soy sauce. No, no, no. You can't take what makes soy sauce good out of soy sauce and call it soy sauce, okay? This is soybean oil, and it's gross, okay? Like, uh, <laughs> and she brought that in our home, you know? I mean, like, we had children, right? I mean, could you imagine if my little girl, my little daughter, was eating her first bowl of, like, lo mein, and she's like, dad, that's soy sauce. And I'm like, here you go, girl. And I gave her that? She would have ate it and been like, yuck, I don't like soy sauce. And I'd be like, no, 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 you never had soy sauce, because that's not real soy sauce. Soy sauce is salty, right? And here's what, here's, here's what I think happens. Jesus says that you, me, we are to be salt of this earth. But what I'm afraid of is that there's thousands of Christ followers who are living low-sodium lives. And you're going to your workplaces, you're going to your homes, you're going to your families, and you're not being the salt of the earth. And the danger of that, the real danger in that is then people engage with you, people interact with you, and they know that you have the name of Christ over you, and they engage with you, and they're like, I don't like that. If that's being a Christian, I don't, I don't like that. Are we giving a true representation of who God is? Are we giving a true representation of what God does? Are we giving a true representation of what it is to be salt of this earth? Because that's what we're called to do. In fact, I love, even when you think about it in context, like the first century context, salt is extremely valuable. 
Do you understand that? Salt was extremely valuable. In fact, first century Rome, their soldiers, part of their pay would be in salt. Can you imagine if your kid, like, hey, mom, can I get my allowance? Sure. You know, like, but it was so valuable. It was part of their pay. In fact, the, the word that we use, salary, the root word for salary comes from salt. Like, like that is where, that's where the expression, I don't know if you heard the expression, he's not worth his salt. That's where it came from. You are salt of this earth. You are extremely valuable. And salt heals. I mean, think about it. even to this day, like, I mean, if you're an athlete, I mean, we've all, I mean, all been there. If you, you know, twist your ankle, then we soak it in Epsom salt. In that culture, people, people with sores, people, they, they would go to the Dead Sea to, to soak in the salt water. You are the salt of this earth. You should bring healing where you go. And here's the thing, wherever salt is, you know it's there. You put salt in something, you know salt is there. Unmistakably, salt is there. So let me ask you, in your workplaces, in your homes, in your life, are you being the salt of this earth? Do people know there's something different about you? Do they know there's something good about you? Do they know there's something valuable in you? And do they know that there's healing that can come from you because God is with you? He says, you are the light of this earth, right? We're to be hope givers. We're to be light givers. We're to be shining for people. We are to be men and women of justice, blessing and helping those around us. That is what it looks like. And then Micah says this, that, that we're to love mercy, to love mercy. The word mercy in the, the Hebrew is hesed. It's loving kindness. It's, it, it's, it's close to forgiveness, but it's, it's this idea that, that we are to allow people to experience freedom. We did a series about you know, like maybe a month ago, two months ago. It's called Grace Period. And in the series, you know, we talked about the grace of God. And after one of the weeks, I was you know, outside and I was greeting people. And, and somebody came up to me and they're like, Brad, what's the difference between mercy and grace? And I was like, I don't know. Um, should have listened to my guidance counselor. Um, I, uh, I was like, but I, I don't know. Because here's the thing. I don't want to lie and make something up. If I don't know, I'll just tell you I don't know. And, but I wanted to know. So I started to study it. I started to read up on it. I started to try to understand. And, and as you look through Scripture and, and, and as you kind of unpack it, what, what you see is there are kind of two sides of the same coin. Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. Grace is giving someone what they do not deserve. Does that make sense? Mercy is not giving someone what they do deserve. Grace is not giving someone what they do not deserve. Um, uh, explain it like this. Imagine uh, you were driving down the road and you were speeding. Now, I know none of you have ever sped before, but just imagine you're going above the speed limit. If a cop pulls you over, if they walk up, they knock on your window, they show you the speed gun, they show you the traffic sign, you know with certainty that you were speeding. If that cop goes, you know what, I'm just going to let you go with a warning this time, get out of here. That's mercy. He, you deserved a ticket, you should have gotten a ticket, but he did not give you what you deserved. He showed mercy. Now, same exact scenario, you're speeding, the cop pulls you over, walks up to your window, shows you the speed gun, shows you the traffic sign, you know with certainty that you were speeding, and he writes you a ticket, $200, here you go. And then he pulls out his personal checkbook, and he writes you a check for $200. I said, there you go. That's grace. He gave you what you did not deserve, payment for what you should have paid. And that's how awesome God is. That's, I mean, that's, that's the, the, I mean, we talk about amazing grace. That's the amazing thing about it. The, the debt that we cannot pay, the debt that we absolutely owe has to be paid for. And then God, he pays that for us. And then he, in turn, calls you and me, we, to be men and women of mercy. 
to forgive people, to give mercy for people who wrong us, to give mercy to the people. Show mercy. And here's what we do, right? We say, yeah, but I don't want to be a doormat. I mean, if I, if I forgive people, if I have mercy on people, then they're going to take advantage of me. I don't want to give too much mercy because then people will think I'm weak. Do you understand it is exactly the opposite of that? There's nothing weak about giving mercy at all. In fact, I mean, just, just think about it like logically. You remember like in elementary school on the playground, that game that we all played where you, you're standing across from someone, you interlock fingers, right, and you're just trying to break their wrists? You play that game, and, and when someone was losing, when someone couldn't stand the pain, when someone wanted to tap out, they would say, and it was the strong person who gave mercy. The same is true when you forgive people. It takes absolute strength to give mercy. And if we are men and women of God, if we are men and women who have the Spirit of God in us, then we should be able to have the strength to give mercy. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 15, the ultimate act of this. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for your friends. It's powerful to give mercy. And then finally, Michael says that we need to walk humbly with God. Now, I am so glad for you that I'm here today because I am the best when it comes to communicating about humility. And what I think you will... Okay. No. It says to walk humbly with your God. And there's two things about this. First is just the idea of humility in and of itself. This is not something that we excel at because we, we live in a, in a culture, we live in, in, a, in a community, right, that it's, it's all about perception. I mean, we, we, we take in so much media that we, even we, when we don't think about it, we understand branding and we understand this idea of marketing ourselves as we're, as we're some kind of commodity. And that's why when we go on social media, we post these things that only heighten our image in other people's eyes. And we're not being humble. We're being honest. We're, like, we're bragging about what we do. And what we end up doing inadvertently is humiliating other people around us. And at some point, we have to be willing to, to live in humility and, and stop trying to bolster ourselves up and, and, and realize that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We realize that we're all flawed to some degree. To realize that we all need the grace and mercy of God and to realize we're all on the same ground. And so at some point we have to take this idea of being humble very serious. In fact, I love the way Jesus puts this. Again, all these three things that, that Micah says, uh, God says through Micah, Jesus ultimately says, and he says this in Matthew chapter 23, he says, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. If we are going to be men and women of God, if we're going to live God, then we have to serve one another, truly be willing to serve people. And here's the thing. What we tend to do is we tend to serve people, but we tend to serve people out of our abundance. I'll serve you when I have the time. I'll serve you when I won't miss the amount of money that I'm going to give you. I'll serve you when it's convenient for me. But that's not true servanthood. What's interesting, I see it time and time again. Many people are fine with serving people up until the point where they start to be treated like a servant. And then they don't like it because it hits their ego. But God says that is what we are to be. We are to serve one another, help one another. And so let me ask you, when is the last time that you truly served somebody? That you truly inconvenienced yourself to be a blessing to others? When's the last time that you allowed someone to stay in your home because they were about to be homeless? When's the last time that you actually got off your timetable to stop and help somebody on the side of the road? When's the last time that you not only you know, threw some change, but you bought food and sat down and ate with someone who was in need? If we're going to be men and women of God, if we want to live lives that honor God, we need to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God.
And I love the verb walk because it connotates an ongoing relationship. Nobody gets it right. We all are taking our next steps. We all are growing in these disciplines. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we should give up. Because if we are going to be the hands and feet in God in this world, of God in this world, then we have to show people who God truly is, a God of justice, a God of mercy, a God who ultimately loved us so much that he served us through Christ. In fact, that's how Micah closes out his book. Look at the last verses here in chapter 7. Micah says this, Who is like you? Who is a God like you? Who pardons the sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? Who, who do, who, um, you do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us, and you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our inequities into the depths of the sea. See, the reason that we can do these things is because God already did them. God showed us ultimately what these looks like. And for you and for me today, we are to live these things out to show this world who God is. Because here's what I know. Your coworkers, your friends who are far from God, they're not going to pick up this book probably. They're definitely not going to read the Minor Prophets. But they're all going to read you. And if you claim to have the name of Christ over you, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, they're going to be looking at you and say, what does that mean? And we should show them. It means to act justly, love mercy, to walk humbly with God.